Hello everyone and welcome to episode 2 in ABRN's webinar series, Collision Repair Shop Best Practices. Today we have a really exciting topic for you. Um, we're going to be going over how to improve painting processes. Specifically what I'm going to talk about is efficiency around the paint booth and the paint shop. I'm going to try to give you some little tips and tricks on how to improve your processes, things you can track to see where you're at at an efficiency level, and what is a good efficiency level. There's a lot of data out there, a lot of stuff you can track right in your own shop. There's even things on your mixing computer you may not know about. And what I'm going to try to help you do is help you understand what those numbers mean and what that data can tell you about the health and efficiency of your paint shop and then how we can improve those things. So we're going to cover a few topics today. Um, we'll briefly go over refinish our goals, so how much you could possibly get through your shop in a day, um, depending on your booth type, what's good, what's bad, um, what's excellent. Um, I'll go over some little tips like floor staging, so that'll be the best way to set up your booth where you can load the next cycle to minimize downtime and extract the most refinish hours out of that cycle as possible. I'll go a little bit over pre-production meetings and planning, so what you can do at the beginning of your day to help set your shop up for success throughout the day, and then if something happens to that plan, how we can quickly readjust and make sure we don't lose any efficiency. Um, I'll talk briefly about parts on and parts off painting, the benefits and maybe restraints to both of those options. Uh, we'll briefly talk about the proper way to load a booth. That's something that seems very simple and easy, um, but believe it or not, it's, it's done wrong a lot of times in a shop. We'll also cover uh, material usage. So again, these are numbers you should be able to find in your shop, but I'll let you know kind of what's good, what's bad, and what's average, so you can compare your numbers to those. Um, we'll also talk about how to improve those numbers a little bit. Uh, lastly, we'll kind of go over the proper booth setup, so how to position things in the actual booth itself, and different tools that can help you optimize that space, like paint stands, um, different things out on the market that help get the most out of every single cycle. Um, and then if we have time, we might also go over spray gun setup. Either way, I'll talk about it briefly, uh, but we'll see where we're at on time, and maybe we'll take a deeper dive into that. Also, if that's a topic you guys want more information on, we could do a whole session just on properly setting up a paint gun and making sure everything is put together in your specific paint booth in a way that's going to get the most out of your paint line and also maximize your refinish hours. Uh, but I will touch on that briefly and give you a few key things to look at. Um, so with that being said, let's dive right into it. So the first thing we're going to talk about today is refinish hours. Refinish hours per day and refinish hours per cycle. The reason I like to stay there is that, or start there, is that's the basis for paint department efficiency. So the, the goal at the end of the day is to get more hours through the shop. Well, a lot of shops that I work with, they are not sure what efficient means or what that number should be. Uh, the benefit I've had working with GFS is I get to work with a lot of different customers and a lot of different paint companies. There's a little bit of variation um, depending on the type of work that you're doing and the paint line that they're using, but if we take all of those numbers and average them together, it becomes pretty consistent. And when we compare that out with what shops are actually doing, it's pretty easy to use that as a benchmark to gauge your shop by. Now when we figure out what that benchmark is, and I go through it with you, you'll be able to use that number to identify if you have weaknesses or maybe you're really strong in an area. And where that can really come into play is when it's time for more equipment. We get approached a lot where somebody says, I need another paint booth. The paint booth now is really my bottleneck. But when we actually go through their production numbers and see how much paint hours they're producing out of that booth each day, the last thing they need is another booth. Um, that'll just add to the bottleneck. We actually need to clean up those processes first. So we're gonna start with refinish hours. Um, again, if we look at all the paint companies across the board, we've come to an average. And what we wanna see is in a booth cycle, is 12 refinish hours per cycle. Um, so that's on a cycle basis. And this comes from the paint companies that have done their own testing and research. And what we found is if you're trying to squeeze more than 12 refinish hours in per cycle, it just becomes cluttered, or maybe it's taking too long to pre-stage stuff outside of the booth, or maybe you're changing between three or four colors in the paint gun and it's taking too much time to do that. 
Um, and then if you're below 12 hours, it means you simply just don't have enough in the booth. There's a lot of shops I've been to where, and I get it, you're in a rush, you're trying to get things out the door. Maybe you're running a full booth cycle and there's just a bumper in there. That would be a wasted cycle or an inefficient cycle. Not that the work doesn't need to be done, there's just a much more efficient way to do it. So what we wanna shoot for is 12 refinish hours per cycle that we run through the booth. So for example, if we were painting a hood and a fender, maybe you have five hours on the hood if you're painting the outside and jamming the inside and another two on a fender, that's seven refinish hours. So it's what's actually on the work order. Now, since we're only at seven, we're a little over halfway to where we should be. So if there's nothing else to do in the shop, absolutely we should put that in the booth and paint it. But first we should take a look around to see if there's something we can squeeze in with that job to get our refinish hours up. Because that's gonna have a major impact at the end of the day, which I'll show you. So again, we want 12 refinish hours per cycle. Now, most shops can get about four cycles on average. per eight hour day. Um, there's gonna be a little bit of variability there depending on how your shop is set up and the type of equipment that you have. If you have a cross draft or a semi down draft booth, typically what we see in most shops is three to five cycles per day. Five is really pushing it. The reason being is you have to mask things a little bit different, differently in a semi down draft or a cross draft booth. Uh, just the way the air moves, it, it wants to pull plastic off of vehicles if that's what you're using for masking. So typically there's extra masking time involved. And then the other thing is, let's say that our airflow, so if we look at our booth from a side profile, if our airflow is moving through this way, and we have one panel up here that we're painting, and then we have a blend panel behind it, so let's say our first box is one door, the second panel is our blend door, in a semi-downdraft or a cross-draft booth, if our front panel is the one that we're painting edge to edge, that overspray could drift onto our blend panel and end up all the way along the back edge. And you may never see it until that's clear coated and put back on the vehicle and set outside. Now all of a sudden we see that our blend panel no, ma no longer matches the rest of the car. Now we have to bring the whole vehicle back in, disassemble it, and now we might be blending into the quarter panel. So with the semi-downdraft booth, we have to move things a little bit further apart or position our blend panels on the intake side of where the air is coming in to minimize that overspray drift. Um, so we're gonna get a little bit less out of that booth style. With a downdraft booth, typically we see between four and six cycles on average. Six being the higher end, and four cycles being kind of the average. If, you're, if you have a downdraft booth and you have the workload waiting in the shop, there's no reason you shouldn't be able to get at least four cycles per day through your shop. And now this is where I ask you to take a look at your numbers because just getting four cycles a day doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing things efficiently. We wanna look at how many hours per cycle we're supposed to have. So again, let's take the, the national average. Most people are spraying in a downdraft booth. If we wanna get 12 hours per cycle and we're spraying four cycles per day, we should be getting about 48 to 72 hours per day out of our paint shop to hit peak efficiency. So if you're a shop that has a downdraft booth, you're doing four cycles a day and you're only averaging maybe 20 paint hours a day, that's when it's time to look at our processes and what we have going on to see if there's a way we can clean that up and make it more efficient. And that's the type of example I was talking about before when I'll get approached by shops sometimes that say they need another booth. But if their refinish hours per day are only maybe 20 to 30, they don't need another booth yet. First, we need to take that hard look inside, clean some things up, find out where maybe we're leaking a little bit of efficiency. Once we get that dialed in, we'll be able to find out the true performance we can get out of our paint booth, and that's when we can assess if it's time for more equipment or not. So these are gonna be the key numbers we're gonna go by, and what I'm gonna do now is show you different ways that we can get closer to that 12, or maybe even exceed that four cycles per day to really boost our efficiency. Because now if you look at your numbers and maybe you're at 40 some hours per day, um, but you still have work and work not being done that day and there's a backlog and the booth is your bottleneck, 
If that's the case, we still might be able to get up to 62 or 75 hours per day just by incre increasing this cycles per day number. Maybe this average is all right. So now we'll break these down individually and I'll show you how we can improve each one of those. So one of the first steps towards efficiency in your shop is gonna start every morning or every e evening with uh, like a post-production meeting or a pre-production meeting. Uh, I know most shops do this for their entire body shop. It's also important to have a section of that dedicated directly to the paint department or have a separate one just for your paint department. So again, remember I said our key numbers are we should be getting a minimum of four cycles per day. So that's four cycles per day. And within those cycles, we wanna average 12 hours per cycle. So one way we're gonna do this is in this pre or post production meeting. And if it's a post production meeting, it's always good. So this is your end of the day meeting. It's good to go over what you actually got done for the day, what your finish hours were, um, and then what we're gonna be doing tomorrow. So then when we come in our pre-production meeting in the morning, we can make sure everything is set up and ready to go. And there's gonna be a few things we wanna go over in these meetings. Um, the first is pre-planning our booth cycles. So now that we know these numbers, we wanna figure out how can we group vehicles together and how can we position things to make sure we're gonna average about 12 hours per day. And again, if you go a little above or below that, that's completely fine. It's when we have huge swings and variation where maybe we have some that are three or six hours per cycle, and then all of a sudden we have the booth loaded up where your painter's in there for four hours because there's 30 some hours of paint work in there. It's just not the most efficient way to do things. So typically what I like to do with technicians in these meetings, especially our pre-production meeting, is we will draw four squares and these are gonna represent the four booth cycles we're doing that day. Now, if you're gonna end up with more than that, it's easy to add squares later, but instead of just throwing six squares down, first we wanna make sure we're loading these up with the right amount of work before we go ahead and add additional booth cycles. Especially if you're in a climate like we are here at GFS, in the winter it gets very cold in Wisconsin. That booth can be very expensive to run in the middle of winter, especially if we have to run everything through a full bake cycle or even an extended bake cycle in some circumstances. It's gonna be very costly to operate that booth. So if we can minimize the amount of times we're gonna do that, not only are we gonna be more efficient from more more efficient from a production standpoint, we're also going to be more efficient economically. We're not going to take as much money to produce the same amount of work um, that we would by stretching it out into multiple cycles per day. So how do we load these individual booth cycles for the day? Well, there's just a few things to keep in mind, and again, they're going to vary between a downdraft booth and a crossdraft. So in a downdraft, if we're spacing things in the booth, if parts are the same color, so for example, we have a hood and a fender off a car, or maybe a bumper and a fender, those parts really only need to be one to two feet away. Um, downdraft booths are very efficient at moving overspray. You're not gonna have to worry about too much drift onto a blend panel. If one of those you're not painting complete, um, you're not gonna get that contamination. And then obviously we would clear those things together. Now to get to 12 hours, with that job, maybe it's only five or six hours of work, so we know we're gonna have to throw a few parts from another job in there. If you have different colors, typically we wanna be five or six feet apart. So you may be grouping your booth um, by section. So maybe the front half of the booth is gonna be dedicated to this paint code that we pulled off of this job, and then the back half of the booth may be dedicated to that fender and bumper that I was talking about earlier that are a different color. Um, as long as we maintain that little bit of space between those parts, it's perfectly safe to paint those in the same booth cycle together. Um, where there's gonna be a little bit of variation is if you have a semi-downdraft booth, we're gonna need more space between those parts. And then the other thing you're gonna want is good quality paint stands with wheels so you can shift things around. Because typically what you're gonna to wanna to do is spray parts on the exhaust side of the booth. So if this is an overhead shot of our paint booth, 
and it's uh, directional, so a semi down or a cross flow. So maybe our air is moving through the booth this way, again, looking from the top. You want to be painting in this section, and then the parts that you're not painting are going to be up towards the top in that safe, clean intake air to avoid any sort of color contamination that may be coming from in the metallics you're spraying or something like that. The other thing we want to do in both scenarios, if we're spraying multiple colors, is you always want to spray your metallics first or your pearls first, and then any solid color second. The reason being, if a little bit of solid color drifts and somehow ends up on a panel, you almost will never see it, unless an extreme case where maybe you were spraying white and black together. Maybe if a little black uh, drift happened, you could see, it might even look like little dirt spots or something. But as long as you're tacking things properly, you should have no issues whatsoever. But where that becomes more tricky is with metallics. A lot of those metallics are so fine, um, they're easy to miss with a tack cloth. Even if you turn the lights off in your booth and go in with uh, some type of sun gun or sun lamp and turn it on, you may not see those metallics. It may not be till after those parts are clear coated and put outside and all of a sudden they're reflecting in the sun that we realize we have an issue and we might have to repaint. Um, so the key there is always paint your metallic colors first. So if we do happen to miss tacking off any of those those metallics that could have possibly drifted when we spray our solid base coat it's going to fully cover those so that'll eliminate any type of color contamination just as an extra backup in case we miss something in the cleaning process so i usually tell people if you follow those two things you can really start to load your booth up um, obviously if you're having booth performance issues where you don't think that's possible the best thing to do is either reach out to your local paint booth distributor or even your paint jobber. Usually they have volometers and tools like that they can bring out and actually check the airflow of your booth and they'll be able to determine what the spray zone of that booth is. And that's very crucial to know. So air is obviously moving through your entire booth but a section of that booth is what we call the spray zone and that's where the air velocity inside is at the optimal speed. And typically across all paint companies, um, if we take all of their numbers and average them together, typically we want to see on the low end about 70 to 80 feet per minute and at the high end around 120 feet per minute. So in the corner of your booth, if the airflow is maybe 20 or 30, we want to avoid that area and not think of that as a productive area to spray in. It may be fine to move parts over there when they're not being sprayed, but we don't want to actually spray in that environment because we're not going to be evacuating the overspray properly. Um, the other key to learning the actual spray zone of your individual booth is what I'll show you next is we'll actually lay that out on the floor of the shop and that'll be called our floor staging area. And floor staging is one of those key things that a lot of shops have used to really gain efficiency. So what floor staging is, is again, we have our, our spray booth is maybe, let's say it's 30 feet long and 15 feet wide. Well, if we measure our airflow and we find out that our optimal spray zone is maybe 25 feet wide, or sorry, uh, 12 feet wide and 25 feet long, we want to lay out a square on the floor in our shop that's that size. And what we do is, while we're painting this first job of the day, so we've loaded up our 12 hours, we know we're doing a hood, a bumper, and then a fender hood fender from another job. While the painter's in there physically spraying this, what we want to do is in our staging area outside is start to load that up with our next 12 hours of work. Because let's say we couldn't figure everything out perfectly and maybe we had 10 hours in there. When we get it all loaded up in our little spray zone on the floor, we might see an opening and say, ooh, I could easily fit another bumper in there. So let's go around the shop or check with the guys up front to see if there's a single bumper somewhere coming in that we could throw in with that cycle to to boost that efficiency. So we really want to be able to use that spray zone to help build our blocks and figure out what we have for floor space for booth efficiency. Um, <clears throat> you'll continue moving through this through the rest of your the work that you think is going to be ready that day. If there's something that's in primer that needs to be sanded, everything's still going to need to be masked, we know that's going to slide further down this list. 
things that are ready are gonna be right on top. And typically what I try to tell people in a post-production meeting is before we go home, let's get all the stuff for this first cycle loaded in that staging area if the booth's not open. If the booth is open, let's get it in the booth so when we come in in the morning, all we have to do is wipe things down, hit the spray button on the booth, and in 10 minutes we're shooting sealer or color. Um, the quicker you can get on things in the morning, the more productive your day is gonna be. Uh, next what we'll do is I'll, I'll show you how to actually lay out um, or how we lay out different types of uh, outlines for um, our floor staging and from there I'll show you how to optimize that. So now I'm going to show you how I help shops uh, start this floor staging process. And the first is to lay out our spray zone. So as you can see behind me we have a full downdraft booth. Um, we use this booth all the time. This is in our training center at GFS. Uh, so we do a lot of technician training here. Not just painters, but actual service technicians. So this booth has been measured many times for airflow. So I know that this booth, it's about 30 feet long and 14 feet wide. Our spray zone in this booth is about 12 feet wide and about 28 feet long. What I'm gonna do is first I'll turn off the lights here so you can see me a little better. So what I'm gonna do here is with actual tape on the floor is we're gonna lay this out. So I'll close my doors. <clears throat> so now you should be able to see the edges of the actual booth. Uh, and usually I like to step a little ways away from the booth so we can actually swing the doors open. So I know that my first mark is gonna be about a foot or two inside the door on each side. And then all you do from that point is mark that out by joining those together. Now we know that this is the front of our spray zone. Now typically in a shop what we do, can do is continue to move all the way down the side. And we know for this booth we're going to go about 28 feet. So we would measure that out and then fully box in so we have our nice green tape box outside. That's now our floor staging zone. So when we talked about that four cycles per day that we want to get 12 refinish hours per cycle, now we can start transitioning parts that are prepped into this taped off area to see if we have room to squeeze anything else in. And we can also start to position things to make sure they're far enough apart that we don't get our color contamination that we talked about. So that's the simple basic way to do that floor staging. Now at some shops, they usually try it with tape first. If they find a good dedicated space to start laying that stuff out, they'll actually paint that on their floor and make sure that no vehicle is ever parked there. That spot always needs to be open for floor staging. Uh, some of the more efficient shops I've worked with, they'll actually lay two or three of those out. So once they do that pre-production meeting that we went through, they can start to dedicate parts to stall one, stall two. Maybe they have a silver bumper that doesn't need to be out for a couple days and they have a silver car that's getting sanded in the prep area that won't be ready for maybe three or four hours. They can put that one in zone three so they know that once that car is finished and prepped, that can load up and go in that same spot and they don't have to worry about overspray. Where alternatively, if they just try to squeeze the first thing done into that spot, maybe now we're painting a silver bumper with a black car and we have to be really conscious of our overspray and clean everything twice to make sure we don't get any type of contamination. Uh, so that's the basics of floor, st floor staging in a drive-through type scenario. Next, I'll briefly cover a side load scenario. So we, we showed you briefly kind of how to set up floor staging um, for a drive-through type booth if your, your next job is going to be positioned right in front of it. Now what we have is a side load setup, um, which I'll show you here in a second. But this can also be used in any open bay in your shop, anywhere that's going to be used for a floor staging area. So as you can see, we've run our tape all the way through here. Again, this has measured the size of the actual spray area of our booth, not the full booth dimension. And again, the reason we want to do that is we know as long as we are in or on these lines that we're going to be okay to spray in that area. Um, you don't want to do it the size of your booth because you might have something set up against the edge and you don't realize until you try to move it in there that realistically you're not going to be able to get past the part. You're not going to have enough room to actually get in there and spray. So that's why we like to mark out the actual spray zone itself. So we have our square 
all the way around. Again, you can just do that with tape if you want. If you have it figured out and it's working really well, that's where you might want to think about something more permanent. So everybody in the shop knows that that's a dedicated area that needs to constantly be getting filled with the next stage job instead of it all of a sudden becoming some other production area where somebody's priming parts or something like that in there. Um, for our specific example here, this is an ideal. This is part of our dual prep station right next to our booth. Um, so you can see there's floor grading and stuff like that. In a normal shop, we would want to keep this a sprayable area, but for demonstration purposes today, this is our floor staging area. So again, our keys are 12 refinish hours per cycle. So let's say we had a light front end hit. Um, so now we have some parts to paint. So we got our fenders first. Um, we'll slide those into our spray area. So if I put those all the way up into the corner, I see I have quite a bit of space left. Now, if that was a bigger front end hit, um, we're gonna have the bumper too. And now these parts are the same color, so we know they can be close to one another. So as long as everything fits on the edges of the sprayable area, we know that we're good. So let me grab a bumper here. And you don't have to wait until the parts are prepped to bring them here. This is a good way, just like I'm doing now, even in your pre-production uh, meeting, to set things down to see if there's even gonna be room for the stuff. So let's say we have a new bumper. We'll probably put this on a different style stand when it actually comes to paint. But I wanna see if I position this bumper by the lines, front and back, if I have enough room to move through. And if these are all the same color, I have plenty of room to get around. I can spray my clear, spray my edges without running into any additional panels. So if I was only getting maybe two hours per fender and three to four for the bumper, I'm maybe at, I could be anywhere from five to maybe eight hours of production. So now that we started to utilize floor staging, we can see in that booth cycle, we still have all of this extra space. So if we have a color that's similar, let's say all these parts are gonna be maybe the gold color that's on this fender. I know if I have a silver or gold, I can be a little bit closer to these. If we have another vehicle in the shop that's maybe a solid color, I'm going to have to start staging from the front end of this box. Um, so again, in this example, maybe we have four hours in there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, or sorry, uh, five to eight hours. So I'm going to look around the shop for a, like a four to six hour job, which could be something pretty simple. It could be bumper fender. It could just be two bumpers that I could put in here if they're a well-written estimate, though, if they're new bumpers, might be uh, three to five hours a piece on those bumpers, and I have plenty of space for them. And that's where I really like to start talking a little bit about um, parts off painting. So I know most of you guys out there are doing that already, but I still see some shops that are a little bit reluctant to change. Um, and I get that when I was a production painter um, and we were first approached with doing mostly parts off painting, I was worried. I thought I was gonna be repainting a lot of parts because it gets scratched during reassembly. Um, what I learned is those body guys really know what they're doing. If something comes over to them painted, they're gonna get it on without damaging it. Um, in the course of maybe five or six years of parts off painting, I've had to repaint two or three things and it's usually from something stupid that probably would have happened anyway. It wasn't necessarily during reassembly. Those parts are pretty well pre-fit now before they come off the car. The other advantage that we're really gonna get from parts off painting is uh, say this car here, for example. Um, this one is set up on our side load system. Um, but basically what we have here is there's a fender and a door that need to get painted. Um, we don't have to get into the rear door and we don't have to get into the quarter panel. Now, typically in a lot of shops, um, the more traditional way of doing this is just like we have it here. Let's say we were replacing this fender and we had a blend into this door. Um, they would jam this fender, so spray the, in, the inside. That's gonna have to sit for at least an hour minimum, and the time it took to spray the inside parts of that fender and mix up paint for it, you could have sprayed the whole thing at once. So we get a much bigger time savings by spraying the entire fender off the car. Now the other thing people say is, well, this door is on there, there's wiring inside of there, I don't wanna pull that off. 
um, just to go to paint. But if you look at the size of the vehicle, if I were to slide this into our spray zone, it pretty much takes up the entire thing and we maybe have a four to six hour refinish hour type job that's going in there. So we have a lot of wasted space. So with a lot of these newer vehicles, the electrical is not as complicated as it used to be. There's typically one single quick disconnect that's inside of there and you usually only have four bolts to remove the door. So me as a production painter when I was at the shop, I would give the body tech some of my refinish hours just to remove those panels and I'll tell you why. So this door, I know a good body guy, it's going to take him 15 minutes to get the thing off of there, um, especially if it was already prepped for paint. Um, worst case scenario, a half hour to put it back on, maybe the same. I was willing to give my body guys two hours of my refinish time because of what I'm going to get on top of it. So think of this is in the, in the paint booth now. I can only do this job. I've got, you know, two hours for the fender, hour if it's a blend panel, maybe two if I'm lucky. So maybe four or five hours, it's going to eat up a whole cycle. If I pay my body guy two hours to remove that, I can get all of these other parts in with that same job and now I just got 12 to 15 hours out of that same cycle. So even though I've given up just a piece of this, I've gained doing the same job two more times just in one booth cycle. And that's where painters can really start to think things through and really start to elevate the production going through their paint booth. And for a commission-based painter, it's a win-win. Not only is the shop going to make more money and the production is going to go up significantly, as a painter, I can get two to three times more refinish hours per day than I was getting before just by painting parts off. Now there are gonna be some extreme examples where it's just not possible. Obviously, if you're painting the quarter panel, anything that's actually welded on, or you're painting any inner structure, that car needs to be in the booth. But now that we have our floor staging area mapped out, this one's on a side load system, so I can simply push it right into place. I can see, okay, I might have room to get one or two more parts in there along with it to at least try to boost it. Instead of just getting the four hours, maybe I can get seven or eight. At least that's closer to that optimal 12 than I was at without trying to get anything in there with it. So parts off painting is, is massive. It's been a huge gain in efficiency for a lot of shops out there. And the mistakes don't really happen. Just again, keep those things in mind. Light colors can be one to two feet apart. Uh, different colors need to be a minimum of about five feet apart and try to spray your metallics first and solid second. Um, one more thing I'll touch on with parts off painting and floor staging is get good paint stands. They are well worth the investment. Even the expensive stands are maybe three to five hundred dollars they will pay for themselves very quickly um, again there's a bunch of brands out there I believe these ones are from innovative tools I know there's other ones like them um, but these are just well built well thought out stands so here we can put fenders on each side these parts unscrew and this whole arm can come off. If we decide at the last minute we want to remove a fender, we're not stuck uh, grabbing all new stands and remounting things. You can simply remove it. So make sure you get stands that are good and they're paint friendly. They're going to make your paint team more efficient. Um, I've seen some people go in and they want to buy the cheapest stands possible. And there are some good ones out there. One of the best hood stands I've seen is actually one of the cheaper ones. Um, but make sure you ask your painter and see if it's going to be something that's going to work for them. Um, otherwise, some of them are more of a hassle than they're worth. The other thing I like about these is with this fender stand, we can clearly reach all of our inside parts. But more importantly, when it comes to something like a hood, when it comes to something like a hood, we want something that has hooks that can grab some of the holes inside of the panel so we can paint around every single edge we need to paint in one single shot. Um, and what I mean by this, we don't want to have to paint the inside, move some parts, and then touch it up later. We want it all done at one time. When the paint's in the gun, that's the best time to spray it. Anytime you have to go back and re-add that paint, something is broken in that process that we could clean up and save a little bit of time. The other nice thing with these stands is they fold flat. Um, and again, Innovative isn't the only company that makes them. 
Um, I just really like their stands. They work well, but there's some other good ones as well. Anytime you can position the panel when you're clear coating and base coating, the same way it's gonna be positioned on the vehicle when it's done is the best case scenario. The reason being is you're gonna be able to see that in optimal lighting to make sure there's no kind of striping or modeling, to make sure everything looks the same. And the other thing is you wanna make sure that the texture of your clear coat is gonna match what it does in the factory. If this is tipped upright, I all of a sudden become pretty limited when I'm spraying my clear. I can only spray it to the point uh, where it's going to hold but not sag. On a hood, if that's a focal point of the car and it's a nicer vehicle without much orange peel, if I lay it flatter, I can spray a little bit heavier or add a little bit more reducer to get that clear coat to flow out. And because it's flat and not vertical, it's not gonna run or sag on me. So I can get a little bit closer to the factory orange peel without having to buff and polish the car, which is again, something we're just wasting time on if we can't get paid for it. So good stands, parts off painting, and floor staging are a fantastic way to boost the efficiency inside of your paint booth. So now that we've talked about floor staging and pre-prepping your booth cycle to have that 12 hour average of refinish hours per cycle, let's talk a little bit about what happens in the booth, the be best way to set it up, little tools, tips and tricks you can use to get the most out of it now that we're getting the right amount of hours in. Um, first thing I like to talk about is lighting. Lighting has come a long way. Um, there's a bunch of different options out there, but if you're looking for any kind of certification, um, what a lot of shops don't realize now is lighting is usually part of that audit. Um, so make sure you do your research of the certification program that you're looking at, whether it's Honda or whatever. Um, they'll have certain lumen levels you need in each area of your shop. And typically where we'll see shops drop below that mark is in the lighting because they've used the same lighting that they've had in their booth and their booth is maybe 10 to 20 years old now. The lenses have a lot of overspray and stuff on them. Clean those things up. Um, you can get reflectors for behind the fluorescent tubes that help bring more of that light out. Or you can switch to LED. LED gets cheaper all the time um, and they're very, very energy efficient. We have a full line of LED products that um, we sell as standard now. That used to be an upgradable thing, but I think most booth companies are just selling that as a standard because the price point has come pretty close to that of the older fluorescent style bulbs. So lighting is gonna be crucial to make sure we can see everything inside that booth when we're painting. Um, another thing I like to talk about is how do we move parts into the booth from that staging area? The first key thing that a lot of people miss, and I get it, I missed it too when I was a production painter, I didn't learn it until I worked for a booth company, is the booth should be running in full spray mode before you ever open the doors. The doors should always be closed unless the booth is running, for the most part. Um, the reason being is a paint booth is built and designed to run to be slightly pressurized. So what that means is our inside pressure is higher than outside. So when we actually open the doors of the booth, if there's any dust or anything right outside of those doors, it's actually gonna push it away. Um, a lot of people have the misconception that because we're sucking air out through the exhaust, if we open the doors, we're gonna pull everything in. But the thing is it's actually the opposite of that. So make sure your booth is running in full spray mode, then you can open up the doors, pull the old car out, bring all the new parts in, close the doors. Once those doors are closed, then you can shut the booth off if you need to do any kind of taping, um, which is also another thing that goes back to that parts off painting I forgot to mention. If you're doing parts off painting, one of the beauties of those scenarios is you don't have to do nearly as much masking. You might have to paper the backside of a door on a blend panel, but other than that, we don't have to mask the entire car, we don't have to bag it, we don't have to tape up underneath. It's just a much cleaner, quicker, and less expensive way to do things. Um, and it also brings less dirt into your booth. If you're not bringing the old car in, um, I know a lot of people pre-wash those now, but still dirt's gonna travel with it. If we can keep that out of the booth as much as possible, again, we're just gonna get better quality paint jobs and we're gonna um, drop down the buffing time needed at the end of the day. Um, other things that help, 
Um, these have become huge in the last couple years. Um, these anti-stat style guns. I know there's a few companies that make these. I couldn't tell you which one's the best or not. Um, this is just what we use here. They work unbelievably well. Uh, where I first really started to see it is in plastic bumpers. You generate a lot of static um, when you're wiping those parts down and cleaning them. Um, it can even cause color shifts at times. These do a great job at keeping everything neutralized and stopping those from attracting dirt to it. Um, technology and boost has changed as well. Our booth has an extra row of filters on each side. Uh, it's called a controlled airflow sealing that also helps make for a cleaner more efficient job and it also helps expand that spray zone so that taped off area on our floor gets a little bit bigger when you start to go to some of the newer booths and some of the newer technology um, the next thing we'll talk about are uh, booth boxes so booth boxes are a great addition um, again a million people make them we obviously have them they're not trying to sell you our booth boxes the reason you need to have someone's booth box no matter who it is is you can keep your tap tack rags your tape any additional things you might need inside your booth in a protected area that keeps overspray away i don't know how many times i've gone into a shop and in the booth there's a little table in the corner and that's where the painter keeps his tape and his tack cloth and they're gray with overspray that's the last thing that's going to touch that car or the paint gun or the hose if you're tack tacking your hose off and typically that tape that's inside the booth is the one they use that while they were spraying all of a sudden some plastic came up and now they got to tape it down so now you've put tape with very loose overspray right next to where you're going to be spraying on a vehicle so that can also create some issues so make sure you use booth boxes um, Make sure they're ones that fully close. I've seen some that are basically more like just a shelf. That's okay if you're hanging a gun on there, but you don't wanna put any supplies on that. Um, next thing we're gonna look at is the air system coming in. So now that we're up here by the our air supply coming in, um, I just wanna explain a few things. A lot of people don't think of their air supply coming in or their regulator or pressure as something to do with booth efficiency, but it actually has a lot to do with painter efficiency. Maybe not how quick you get cars in and out and how much stuff you get done, but it's gonna have a direct correlation to material consumption, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, so the best way you could possibly set up your air is have a separate line coming in just for your spray gun air and possibly your breathing air, depending on your setup. But you want to make sure you have a regulator on the wall inside before your paint gun. A lot of times I've seen these outside on a wall. We don't want that. We want it right inside where the painter has access to it while they're in the booth. The reason being is, Painters should be using this fairly frequently. A lot of times what I see is on the, if the regulator's outside, it'll be set to like 80 PSI, and then the painter comes in, and then they'll adjust their gun down to 25 to 30, whatever kind of gun they're using or paint you're spraying. Um, what that does by choking the gun down that much is it can actually create turbulence and cause your gun to spray inefficiently or ineffectively. So typically these are designed to run almost wide open. So the best way to set up a gun is to actually plug into your airline, open it all the way up so it's running at full pressure, and then you'll hold the trigger and then you'll adjust your wall down until you're about three to five PSI above where you're supposed to be. Um, so for example, this is an RP. So if I was spraying clear with an RP, I typically wanna be at 28 to 30 PSI. So I would hold this wide open, I would adjust this down till on my gauge I see it get to about 35 and then I would finish fine tuning by adjusting it down. That creates nice open passages in the gun, the most efficient delivery of air and the most efficient uh, delivery of materials coming through the gun. Um, it's also important to have some sort of regulator on your gun. If you have a digital gun, that's fine. Um, the SADA guns, you can get the regulators for them. Same with Iwata. The new DeVilbis one has a gauge right on it. Spend the extra money, get the one with the gauges on it because they're going to be incredibly more efficient. Um, and for you shop owners or painters who are responsible for your own materials, this is going to be very crucial for you. Um, so we've done a lot of studies with the paint companies 
Um, we've looked at consumption rates and things like that. And we actually know right down um, with Exalta, for example, we know like on base materials, we should be at about 1.8 ounces per hour on the refinish side. Um, so we're able to see if we're spraying efficiently, maybe our guns are set up wrong. Um, guns should always be dialed in before every paint job. So I like to keep um, cardboard or something like that covered with masking paper in the booth. And I usually put that on a stand and I'll make sure my pattern is spraying nice and even to make sure my gun isn't acting up or needs to be re-cleaned or something like that um, to make sure our consumption is right where it needs to be. So the reason you want to have a gauge on there, so we talked about that, um, we have set numbers for consumption. If your PSI is off even by two or three PSI, that can have a direct correlation that comes out to about 12 ounces per actual hour of spraying difference in material. Um, those of you tracking your materials realize how expensive that can actually be. Clear coat's not cheap. Um, the new base coat colors and stuff are not cheap either. So that can have a huge impact on material usage. Um, I saw an amazing demonstration with primer um, with a, a SADA gun where everything was dialed in perfect and we actually measured the consumption. And I never would have guessed we could have done three full coats of primer on a spot that big with as little paint as we used. It's pretty impressive what paint guns do when they're dialed in correctly. So make sure this stuff is all set up the right way. It's just gonna help you improve. Um, I'll show you, since we talked about consumption, I'll show you a cool way to track it, at least on the clear coat side next. So we talked a little bit about how a properly set up spray gun um, dialed in the right way is going to have a direct correlation to efficiency as far as it comes to material usage. Now, when you're mixing all of your paint in the computer um, for specific jobs, it's always going to be connected to that work order number. Like typically you have to type in the work order no matter what paint system you're using. You type in the paint coat, all that stuff. So we're tracking base coat. Um, on clear coat, I've seen it kind of mix. Some shots, some shops do it, some don't. When they're mixing their clear, it gets attached to a job. But you'll notice as we start to build towards efficiency and we're combining some of these jobs together, um, we're not always going to be tracking that the right way. We might be mixing extra clear and it might get attached to one job even though we're painting three with it. So sometimes it can be hard to track how efficient our material usage is when it comes to clear coat, undercoats, things like that. Now, um, well, clear coat is an expensive one, so I always, t always tell people to track that. Typically, again, if your gun is dialed in perfectly, an ideal consumption rate for clear coat is gonna be around 1.8 ounces per refinish hour. Um, a good way to track that and monitor it, and even as a painter, this is a good thing to do because you'll be able to see if you should adjust your mixing ratios or anything else, is I just take three quarter inch tape and a marker, and every time I mix clear coat, I write down how much clear I mixed right on there. So let's say I just had one work order come through, um, and we're going to pair it with maybe another one to get to our 12 refinish hours. Um, so let's say in this specific booth cycle or this round of mixing clear, I'm mixing it for 12.7 refinish hours worth of spraying. Um, so it's important not, not to mark the ounces, but it's actual hours. So 12.7 hours. And what we'll do then is we'll put that right on that can. Next time we mix clear for something else, we're gonna do the same thing. Um, let's say it was the end of the day, we needed to get a car out, we didn't have a full cycle, but we knew that in our pre-planning meeting, we knew we'd have one light cycle at the end of the day, hoping that maybe something else would be ready to throw in with it. Nothing ended up being ready, so we only had 8.5 hours on that cycle. So the same thing, I'm gonna write down 8.5 hours once I mix it and stick that right on the can. And basically what we're doing is building a, an hour summary on that can of clear coat. So now when that can of clear is empty, I can add up the refinish hours and see how many refinish hours I'm getting 
um, out of my clear coat. And then I can actually start to track that and see how I'm doing, if I have stuff left over, how I compare to other shops, am I really efficient, am I not efficient. Um, and again, the numbers we want to go by is typically unclear, ideal is about 1.8 ounces per hour. If you're less than that, you may be putting your clear coat on a little bit too thin, um, which could cause problems years down the road. If you're going way heavier than that, obviously we have some waste somewhere. We're over playing clear, maybe we're throwing a lot away, uh, maybe we just aren't mixing properly. So that's a good thing to track. If you're using any of the, uh, the standard US stuff, um, let me grab a can. So a one gallon can that looks about that size. Um, typically out of a gallon can, um, you should be getting about 71 hours, refinish hours minimum, out of a gallon can of clear coat. I know a lot of lines, um, this one is Spies Hecker for example, but even BASF and some of these other lines now, um, they use the European style can, which is a five liter can instead of a gallon. For those, we should be getting about 93 to 94 refinish hours out of every can of clear coat. Um, Cause obviously you're mixing your hardener and reducer with it, depending on the paint line, sometimes just hardener, but actual clear in the can is what we're basing those refinish hours off of. So that's another great way to track efficiency of yourself as a painter, or if you're a body shop owner of your paint team on one of the expensive coatings. And typically that'll give you insight into the other products. If you're lighter heavy here, it's probably the same on base coat. So now we just got to figure out why. Do we need to look at the guns? Maybe we need new guns that are more efficient. Maybe it's some simple adjusting, or maybe it's putting a regulator inside the booth. Either way, checking these small things and making sure we have clean paint jobs is all gonna add to the efficiency side of our day in and day out of working towards that perfect scenario of 12 hours per day and four cycles a day. So in summary, there's a lot of things you can do to boost your efficiency. Um, there's amazing tools out there. We showed a few of those today. A few other things like stands, um, side load systems, things like that that can really help improve your shop efficiency. Um, these side load systems are cool. I mean, the way stuff is built now, one person can slide a car in and out of a booth. If it's fully masked up, um, it can go into the booth. We can close the door and we don't have any downtime whatsoever. All we gotta do is wipe it down and spray. Um, we can even section off other areas. Doors close, they go up and down. There's stands, there's all kinds of stuff. But the bottom line is a lot of this stuff isn't gonna necessarily help you until we figure out the number side first. And again, those numbers are right here. Get to know these numbers and find out where you are in your shop. And remember, with a downdraft booth, we want a minimum of four cycles a day, and we want to try to average 12 refinish hours per cycle. That's where we're going to hit that peak efficiency. As we go above that, it'll fall off a little bit. As we go below 12 hours, it'll fall off a little bit. So try to stay around that sweet spot. Um, that'll really help boost things considerably. Make sure you do those pre and post production meetings. Plan out those four booth cycles you're gonna have that day. As you start to get more efficient, we might be adding a couple more boxes. Maybe we get up to six, um, where we're starting to get to 72 hours of refinish time per day, which would be amazing. Um, if you ever have questions or need help with any of that stuff, never hesitate to reach out to us here at GFS. Um, your paint job or your paint companies, a lot of those guys and girls know this information and they're amazing at helping you get there. Uh, because you can have side load, you can have Revo like we have in the background to cure really fast, you can add two more booths, but if you're not hitting these peak efficiency hours, you're kind of throwing your money away. So clean up your processes first, let's hit those peak hours, and then everything else will sort of fall into place and you can really assess your shop to find when is the right time to spend money on something and or what should I spend money on first. Do I need help curing something? Do I need help on material usage? Or am I really hitting my numbers and now it's actually time for another spray booth? I hope this information was informative to you. Um, we're looking forward to the next episode in our webinar series here with ABRN. And thanks for checking it out.